I'm Ramika Vincent Leary from WSRE TV, interviewing the fastest man on earth, Justin Gatlin. Justin, it is so good to be in your presence this afternoon. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good. I'm you feeling psyched? Good. I am. I'm very psyched. I know you're always psyched when it's time to come home and visit mom and dad, right? Always. You know, I, home is always where, you know, you can relax and be yourself. So I always rush to get home as much as I can. I hear you, brother. So mom and dad, I tell you, I had a chance to speak with them over a year ago before you went to Rio. And as parents... How have they influenced you to be the wonderful man that you are today? You know, it's just a mixture of their character that they instilled in me. You know, just my dad's been in the military, so he's given me that discipline. And obviously everyone knows my mom. She's a no-nonsense but still kind <laughs> woman. So, you know, she has given me that when I get it ready to uh, go out and compete. Are there any specific qualities that they have passed on to you, maybe one or two that you can think of? Be me. Always be me, you know, um, regardless if it's good, bad, ugly, you know, just be who I am. And I think that's, that's, how, that's given me the success I've had so far in life and in track and field as well. All right. Now, preceding the 2016 Olympics, of course, you know, there was a lot of talk about you, Usain Bolt. People were saying, is there some rivalry there? How did you overcome all of the pressure for the 100 meter event preceding Rio? Um, I looked at 2015, actually from 2012 on, from 13, 14, 15, and 16 and said, okay, my approach needs to change. Um, not taking anything away from Usain and what he's done for the sport, but I have to look at him as just another runner, just another man that I'm competing against. If I get to the line, I train all year to compete against one person, which I only com run against him one time a year, you know, um, I'm putting myself at a deficit. So I have to go out there believing that all the fortitude, all the speed I have, all the talent that I have is good enough to get the job done. And that's what I did in 17. I didn't worry about, you know, the presence that he, you know, he has and he brings such a domineering, you know, presence to the track. And some athletes are taken out of their zone with that when they see that. Right. I've been around it so long and so much that I'm able to adapt to it. And that's what you saw in 2017. I adapted to it. So in a sense, were you competing with yourself? Necessarily. I, I mean, I had to. I mean, you know, I wasn't in the, in the middle of the track, if you've seen the race. I wasn't next right. to Usain like I usually am. Um, and then we had a young gun, Christian Coleman, who was next to him. And I think everyone in the world was trying to see exactly how they were going to duke it out. And me being eight probably was probably the most dangerous thing that they could have done. It put me in lane eight. Because, <laughs> you know, um, watching me at the Olympic trials in the 200, I was in lane eight. I couldn't see anybody. And I still was able to, to win and snatch that victory. So I kind of just emulated that same thing going into the, into the 2017 World Championship Finals. It's lane eight. I'm out there by myself. I only have two other guys to even see. It's one guy in lane nine, fortunately, and then another guy in seven. And both of those are two opposite kind of runners. You know, one is a starter and one is a, a finisher. So I was able to pull off of that and be able to run my own race. So after the Olympics, I had a chance to view your documentary, Rise Again, at the Pensacola Little Theater. And I loved it. I laughed. I cried. It was so emotional. I was with you. It felt like I was right there. <laughs> Honestly, there's a quote near the beginning of the documentary where you say, quote, life is fun, it's beautiful, but it's cold, cutthroat, and nasty. I've witnessed both. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think everything I've been through my life and my career kind of just, it shows that, you know, my ups, my downs, and my ups again. Um, it puts me in the position where I know what it feels like to be the fair-haired child, you know, the one that everyone loves and couldn't do no wrong. And then once I was away from the sport, you know, I was a stepchild. I was a guy who was, you know, always reaching to be the best, and it was just never enough. And then be able to come back and being strong again, being uh, loved and respected again, you know. So 
it, it shows that life can be very judgmental towards you, but that's what life is. That's how we are as humans. Right. And I don't, I don't have a chip on my shoulder because of that because I know that's how we are, but I just have to be myself. I have to be who I am and go through life and say, okay, at the end of it, I've been Justin. I didn't waver back and forward and being someone else or you know, let everyone else's opinions cloud my judgment of who I am. Apropos the name of the documentary, Rise Again. So seeing all the support, the love here in Pensacola at that screening, how did that make you feel? What was going through your mind? I tell everybody around the world, you know, um, I always love to come back to Pensacola. It doesn't matter if it was only 10 people in the audience or 10,000 people in the audience. It's the love that Pensacola has, you know, for their athletes. They realize that they're a small town, a small community, and a small city, but everyone here has big hearts. And I think that's what's really in the water when it comes to the athletes. They know that you can come here, you can focus on your athletic ability, your academic ability, and then you can go out into the world with the confidence knowing that you have the backing of a beautiful city like Pensacola. And let me tell you, I saw a vast array of people in the audience, people that had Gatlin t-shirts on, people were cheering and standing up and clapping. It was so <laughs> emotional. All right, so let's turn the tide here. 2017, London, England, fastest man in the world. You are so humble, by the way. But step by step, take us from start to finish of the race. What was going through your mind 100 meters? Man, um, I was just thinking at the starting line, I had to, I think the last couple of races, I had to figure out like, okay, I wanted to get out in front and hold off the field and hold off Usain as long as I can. And I felt like that was a good strategy, but wasn't good enough. And it's proven that it wasn't good enough for me as a runner. Okay. It was good for Christian Coleman, who grabbed the silver right behind me. Um, but for me, it was a little different. Um, watching myself, I had to go back and watch races from 2004, 2005, and six, where I wasn't the best starter in the world. I wasn't getting out in front of the field. I was getting, with, getting out with the field, right. and I was able to run everyone down or kind of stretch, you know, stretch the lead. And I said, well, let me, I have nothing else to lose. This is Usain's last year, his last championship, right. his last race. I was like, well, let me try something different, because obviously what I've, what I've been doing has not worked. So I put my ego aside, I put my habits aside, and said, okay, let's, let's go back to the beginning where it started from, where I've, where I've gained my championships and I gained my notability. It was at, that was my top end speed, and that was what I was able to work on. In 17, I got injured, and I, it, it kind of forced me to work on my top end speed, because my start wasn't where it needed to be. I wasn't strong enough. And it showed in the race. I got out. I wasn't in, in, in the lead, but I was able to hold on with the pack. And then halfway through the race, I just kicked in another gear, and I just kept running to the finish line. Awesome, awesome. When you heard fastest man in the world initially, how did you feel? Exuberance, <laughs> I know, but what was going through your head? Okay, it, Justin. It felt like home. I, I can't really ex explain it, you know. I think other people would say, you know, if they were in my position, they would feel excited overwhelmed, it felt like home. Like because, home. yeah, because it was like, you trained so hard for that moment. You trained so hard for those nine seconds. And you trained to be a winner, you trained to be a champion. And when it happens, you have a sense of relief. You know, everyone else is shocked and excited. Oh my God, you did it, I can't believe <laughs> yes. you did it. But inside, you're like, I did it. That's what we trained for, that's why I'm here. That's right. Yeah. So let's talk about you and Usain Bolt on and off the track. People have their perceptions, don't they? They say, <laughs> Justin, Usain, they got to hate each other. What's the real story? You know, throughout our career, battling back and forward, we've always had the respect for each other, and it's actually grown throughout the years um, to where it, it kind of not just an athlete versus athlete. It was actually coach versus coach. Okay. You know, his coach respects my coach, vice versa. And, you know, I respect his coach. He respects my coach. They know that he, Usain even told me this year at the championships, he said, hey, when Gatlin steps on the line, he's going to be coming. He's going to have his A game. He's going to give right. you all he has and vice versa. So each year when we begin the season, 
I'll be, I'm watching out for what Usain is doing, what and I know doing. he's watching out for what I'm doing as well. So our our rivalry has always been a gentleman's core. You know, it's been That's a good way to put it. yeah, it's it's something that I think has been sensationalized through the media more, and has tried to make it uglier than it needs to be. But when you have a respect for an athlete, you know, it's it's almost equal to where you have love for your family because that athlete shows you who you are. Usain has showed me my strengths. Usain has showed me my flaws. I'm able to go back each year and work on those things and be, and be a better human, but also be a better athlete. So I had to pay homage to him after I crossed the finish line at that last race. I'll never be able to have that kind of rivalry again that, I've, that helped build me into the just that I am today. Well said. Now, Usain you. says he will never race again, but if we hear people say that all the time, right? <laughs> Do you think he'll ever step back on that track? I don't know. That's going to be hard to say. You know, I jokingly said to him that you are going to race again and you're going to owe me $100. I'm betting on it. <laughs> I mean, when you have a passion for something, it's hard to step away from. So I think that in any magnitude, he will be back in the track and field world. Um, you know, he expressed to me, said, hey, man, this is my last race. My legs are hurting me. My kneecaps are hurting me. He says he's feeling it now. Yeah. Um, and it can be taxing on your body. It can be wear and tear. But when you have a passion for something, you're going to try it one more time if you can. But he has, he's won everything he's can, he can win in That's the sports. True. So it would be interesting to see where he's going to go in the next couple of years. Let's talk about 2020 in Tokyo, Japan. Have you made any decision regarding whether or not you'll compete in the next Olympics? I plan on it. You know, um... After winning 17, I actually have the bye for 19. Good. So I already have the ticket to be at the starting line for the 100 meters in, uh, in Doha, Qatar. So thinking that 2018 is going to be an off year where it's not going to be a championship year, but I'm going to still run around the world, I want to be able to have fun with that, be able to go to the meets I want to go to, take my time, run fast, rest, run fast, rest. And rest, and, right? And rest, exactly. <laughs> and then get ready for... 19, which is going to be an unorthodox year where usually a championship is going to be in um, usually September, August, okay. September, and it's going to be in October. So it's going to be kind of weird for everybody, but at the same time, hopefully that year will piggyback and help 2020 be a great year. So to answer your question in a yes. long form, I plan on getting ready for 2020, but I'm, I'm going to focus on each year as, in, as it is 2020. All right. So do you know the events? Definitely 100 meter, <laughs> right? Right. So far, I'm just going to specialize in 100 meter okay. and, the, and the relay. That's so. awesome. That is awesome. So let's talk about Justin Gatlin off the track. You are multifaceted. You have your hand in a lot of different areas. Let's talk about the things that you do for others from that aspect. Well, um, I have a humanitarian side. Um, it's always been knocking at the door for me to, to do so. It's just so hard to, to be able to give back the way I want to because of my career and how much I'm gone, how much I'm training. You know, so I try to give back where I can. I, I visit children's hospitals in Orlando where I train at. Uh, I try to do here in Pensacola with the Golf right. Coach Kids House and Ronald McDonald House here as well. Um, I try to, at, at every aspect to be, give back to, and inspire young athletes. You know, I didn't have that opportunity to be uh, hands-on inspired. Okay. You know, I, I've seen people from afar do certain things and that inspired me. But I, I think that, that goes for everybody. A lot of athletes see athletes on television. They and, do. And they are inspired by that. But you get to a point where you're like, Okay, how do I get to that level? How do I get myself inside that television and be seen by millions of people around the world? So that's where I try to come in. I try to help other athletes and other, uh, other young athletes to come to be able to empower themselves. But even outside of that, you know, that's why I started my Justin Gatlin Foundation. And it's to be able to help uh, the youth in the future to be able to believe themselves. They may not become the next gold medalist or a professional athlete. They may become doctors, dentists, lawyers, someone that's going to be uh, positive in the community, and even teachers. And I want them to be able to go out to have the confidence to inspire others who are going to come behind them. And tell us a little bit more specifically about the foundation. Do 
students or do the children actually come for events or how is that set up? At this point in time, it's more of a, I call it an open, open book foundation. Okay. It doesn't really um, focus on one certain thing annually each year. This year was a kickoff year where we had, um, we did a speed clinic for the kids to be able to teach um, the kids how to be able to run correctly, have good technique okay. and tips. So it gives that age group from eight all the way to 18. So at eight, you know, you have kind of that athlete who you feel like you're kind of awkward trying to, trying to find yourself in your body. So it helps them out. Okay. But also the kids who are 18, it can help give them tips to be able Very to get good. ready for that college bound, you know, journey that they're going to have. You know, Absolutely. so I, I try to help within that, within that area for the, all those kids. All right. Speaking of the youngsters and anyone else for that matter, if someone were to ever say to you, you can't, what would you tell them? <laughs> I've, I've been said I can't many a times. Um, I would tell them to reevaluate themselves first. See in their heart if they can or can't. Don't let someone tell you that you can't. You know, um, and that, I'm only saying that because that's what I had to do for myself. Coming back into the sport for me was a lot of people saying, you're never going to... You're never going to be able to run a Diamond League. You're never going to be able to run with the fastest athletes in the world again. You're never going to be able to win a Diamond League. You're never going to be able to get on the podium again. You're never going to win a gold again. Hmm. So it's a lot of nevers and a lot of can'ts. Right. And I just looked at the situation and said, okay, what's my odds of doing so? And if I work hard at it, what do I need the tools to be able to get to that? And each year I've kind of crafted myself to, to be closer and closer to that journey and be able to win that gold. Right, and sometimes we can be our biggest cheerleaders. Rise again, right? Exactly. So if there are two words that you can think of that would describe you, what would they be? <sighs> I would say uh, a fighter. Well, let me change that. Not a fighter, a warrior. And, um, and kind. I, I, I know it's a, it's a weird mix but, you know, when I step on the track, I'm a warrior, you know, but I always think about the others. Even when I'm on the track competing against my rivals and my competitors, um, I tell them each time before I race, good luck, stay healthy, don't get injured, and may the best man win. You know, and afterwards, I, I go and I shake all their hands afterwards, and I talk to them face to face. And I think that's the kindness in me. You are such a gentleman. So what can we, those who support you, do to encourage you along the way? Just help with me, if you can. You know, um, think about how you can help with um, these kids and the foundation. You know, um, like I said, it's more open-end. So if anybody has ideas or if they want to be able to contribute, you know, to the Justin Gatlin Foundation, um, there'll be information given out. But also, you know, that's how we're able to push and make other Justins and yes. people who are going to be better than Justins. And that's my goal. And that's why I love my sport and I love other sports because, you know, we, we, all, we always cheer for what we have now in the moment. And we make it, we, we want to say that's the best. But I'm always thinking about the future. I'm always thinking about, well, what if there's something better? Tomorrow. What if that, what if, what, yeah, what if tomorrow there's going to be a better athlete? How can we nurture them? How can we make the sport a better place? How can we give these athletes a platform to be able to be who they want to be? You know, speak their mind on what they need to speak on. So, you know, I always think about those kind of things because I've been in there. I've been in that situation where I had to speak my mind or I had to stand up for myself. And along the way, I believe that um, I've acquired more fans because of my fight my fortitude than just because being just because I'm fast. And yes, Justin Gatlin will rise again. He has risen again. <laughs> you are such an humble man. Thank you. Everybody, I just got through <laughs> talking with the fastest man in the world, Justin Gatlin. Such an amazing individual. WSRE TV. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary.